Hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sarah, Alicia, Michelle, uh, Gerda, Alma. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. <clears throat> so we'll have the first slide, please. Okay. Much has been written about Prudence Heward's Girl Under a Tree. And if I can just start by saying, let's call her a woman for the purposes of this conversation. Um, <clears throat> our woman uh, does mark an important moment in Canadian art history as the first truly major nude painted by a woman artist. It's been called a landmark work, and I think it is. But I also see, and thank you, Michelle, for um, you kind of preempted, dealing preempt, you, you actually positioned what I want to talk about uh, really beautifully, which is um, I see how Heward also played by the rules. Um, so that even though she was tethered to convention, we see her really, we do see her efforts to try and transcend that. So I want to recap really quickly kind of, you know, what's when, what are the, what are the main issues that we think about when we think about um, the Heward and what's sort of been written about it. The first is the scale. If you haven't seen it in the flesh, it's a lot of flesh. It's a really big painting. Um, <clears throat> the scale, she's over life size. Um, her physical strength, her musculature, her very toned body, which of course was a favored type during this period. She's a very, very commanding presence um, and unapologetically so. She's very, very viscerally present. The turn of her head. Her gaze is outward towards the viewer. So a lot of this has been made of this. It's not the traditional averted gaze, profile, or even absence of face, so sort of a nude from behind. But she's not actually looking at us. And I'd say that this is Heward's first mitigation. Yes, we're starting to see the beginning of an address or a redress, but not its full realization. The third thing is the placement of the figure in the landscape. That tradition's long and wholly acceptable convention that Michelle so beautifully touched on is a second mitigation. And finally, the fact that she's prostrate, that she's horizontal, is also, I'd say, argue, is a third mitigation. So Heward is being highly strategic here, so much so that when she exhibited the work at the Group of Seven exhibition um, in 1931, that year's group exhibition, um, an Ottawa citizen critic noted that, quote, while it is not sensational, it is assertive. So why wasn't it sensational? And I, and I, I would argue because of all of these mitigating factors that I've just mentioned. You know, she's located somewhere between our lap and the distant shore. Um, and so we can suspend our disbelief. But as an aside, you know, I just want to know what a curious, curious composition it is. I've been looking at this painting in our collection, you know, for decades now. Um, you know, where is she exactly? It's though Heward has painted two quite distinct paintings. You have a rural nude, you know, you have a nude in a, in a landscape in the foreground. And then in the distance, you've got um, a kind of cubist village. So what's exactly, what is the context here? I mean, yes, we've seen, you know, centuries of paintings of the nude in the landscape, but there's this, there's this conversation between an urban and a rural. Did she walk up fully naked from the village to lie on this grassy knoll? You know, there's something, there's something fascinating um, in, that I find in that context. There's also something I think really curious and interesting about the positioning of the tree branch and the tree. So, you know, for me, it works as a kind of formal foil, a kind of screen and the, the, the branch coming into the ground, but it's not sitting on the ground. It's actually, you know, it looks like it's growing out of the ground. Um, so, so that diagonal has always struck me as a really interesting formal device that, that Heward uses. And what I always think of is a lightning bolt. Um, so we've got a signal work, but that's not sensational. Uh, so what was sensational then? Can we go actually two slides ahead because I made a mistake. Perfect, thank you. Um, Lilius Thornton's Nude in the Studio from 1933. 
much ink has been spilled on this work as well. It's only two short years later, it's pulled off the walls at the then Art Gallery of Toronto by the Board of Trustees. So what are the offending bits? In short, pubic hair, strappy sandals, lipstick, nail polish, sure, all of those things. Our Heward also has lipstick on. Uh, sorry, uh, our, our woman under the tree also has lipstick on. But what's really at stake here? To me, it seems, you know, I, and I write this in the, in the essay for the uninvited, it appears that under a tree, i.e. horizontal in nature, is eminently more acceptable than in the studio. And by that mean, I mean upright and in, and, in, and in an indoor space. And this comes back to our capacity to suspend our disbelief. In the Torrance work, we know the model, we know she's a dancer. Um, Lily Torrance Newton has talked about this and an agreement between them. So here, and again, and, and Michelle also uh, spoke beautifully to this. There's this, this idea that there's a communing between the artist and the model, that this model is in her space naked, upright, that there is an arrangement of sorts, must have been, <clears throat> you know, beyond the pale, that, that now we can't suspend this disbelief. We have a new, you know, we have a real live woman who's standing in front of an artist in her studio. Um, if we can go to the, back, the slide before, please, thank you. So um, for many years, uh, it had been suggested that possibly, <clears throat> Uh, the girl under the tree was Hubert herself. And this was, you know, arguably put to rest uh, when the work, when conversations were happening around the work coming into the Art Gallery of Hamilton collection through um, the work of A.Y. Jackson, who was working with the estate. And um, then director at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, T.R. MacDonald, uh, writes to to Jackson and says, um, I recognize her. He was, a, he was an artist himself from Montreal. He said, I recognize her. I recognize the model as I painted her myself. Um, so while we know that it's not her likeness, um, could it be considered? And I throw this out there in part as a kind of projection. I didn't address any of this in my short essay for the, for the catalog, but during the research for this paper, I consulted the letters um, that Hubert was writing to Isabel McLaughlin during this period. Uh, those archives are a gold mine. They are at uh, Queen's University. And the letters between McLaughlin and Hubert on, on Hubert's part are riddled, if not defined, by an overwhelming preoccupation on Hubert's part with her ongoing physical condition, her illnesses and her ailments. She suffered from asthma from the time she was a child and her physical limitations were, were very real and ongoing. And she refers to her physical state and weakness in particular um, repeatedly as a constant frustration and refrain in, in this correspondence. So it's within this mental and emotional state, not just with this painting, of course, but in the period where she is working on this painting. And we know from those letters, the day she actually starts work on this, um, on this canvas um, in January of 1931, because she says, I start work on a painting tomorrow, on a, on a, on a new tomorrow. So it's, 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 in this, it's in this state that she's working on a girl under a tree. And so does this knowledge alter how we look at the making of the picture? I, I personally find it difficult to dissociate that knowledge when looking at the image, but also because we know based on photographs and firsthand accounts that Heward hung this work above her bed for the duration of her life. It was hanging there still when she died. Um, and this is an image that stays with me. This is what I see now when I look at the painting. She had an, uh, a custom designed art deco bedroom set. And um, I see this painting hovering over that space and over Heward on a daily basis. So this context, this decision on Heward's part must tell us something. Uh, in December 31, when she exhibited the work, in a letter to Isabel McLaughlin, she, she says, quote, I would like to see you do some work with a model. I am sure it would interest you. I feel that we are so darn lucky to have a, and she puts in quote, quotes and a question mark, gift for painting, because I don't think anything else takes the place. It is, takes its place. It is something that is completely your own as nothing else is, colon, family, husband, 
for children. I just want to end with a work, if you can skip two slides forward, please, Aubrey. With not a nude, but to my mind functions as a kind of fascinating surrogate nude. Um, the first time I saw the bather in the flesh was at the um, spectacular and landmark Beaver Hall exhibition co-curated by Jacques Desrochers and Brian Foss. And I saw it at the opening at the MMFA and I was stopped dead in my tracks. Um, and I put this work forward as one of the most daring and powerful works painted during this period in this country by anyone, regardless of gender. Um, it pushes the envelope further than any of Heward's nudes, um, you know, regardless of the fact that she actually is wearing her bathing costume. Um, her physicality, her presence, her vulnerability, the reality of her, of her flesh, the opened legs, the positioning of her left hand, all of it. And this bather, as opposed to our girl under the tree, makes eye contact. She stares down, um, oh, sorry, she stares us down. And to me, her gaze is almost like a volley. You know, we're left with, um, you make sense of this. This is for you to reconcile. Um, thank you. <laughs>